So as Lee mentioned, my name is Liz Creekmore and my company is Intel Path. We were founded in 2005 with a specific focus on the Part 101 frequency bands and those include 6, 11, 18, and 23. But our focus today will be on 11 gigahertz for the Mimosa B11. In the past year, uh, since the B11 was made available, we've studied more 11 gigahertz paths than ever before. Uh, it's a very popular band among the Part 101 bands, and this is due particularly because uh, the distance of propagation is very far. Also, the channel width uh, is particularly wide. Um, so 18 and 11 gigahertz have the widest channels available among the Part 101 bands, which is 80 megahertz. Uh, so a single 11 gigahertz channel can yield a very high capacity. Intel Path is stationed in the Chicagoland area, and we're able to study and coordinate paths anywhere in the U.S., Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. So basically, anywhere where the FCC has jurisdiction, we can analyze a path, and we can petition the FCC for a license. Uh, we maintain two databases of information to do the frequency analysis. Uh, our software interfaces with the FCC's database. We also maintain our own database, so paths that are being actively coordinated and shared will show up in our database even if they haven't yet been filed with the FCC. So our main focus over the past several years as ISPs are using licensed radios for the first time has been to make the licensing process as easy and straightforward to understand as possible. So what I've done is I've, I've broken it down into four um, simple to remember steps. And I'll go in depth in, uh, in each of these steps in a minute, but this is a general overview um, of the four steps. And the first one is the frequency analysis. So this is the very first step and it's done by our our engineers will basically take your path information, analyze it in conjunction with all of the, all other paths within your vicinity to isolate an interference-free channel for you to use. The second step is one that's mandated, mandated by the FCC, and it's called the prior coordination notice. Um, basically, it's when we circulate a document to other areas or other operators within a reasonable distance of your proposed path and we allow them to voice an objection or a concern. The standard coordination process takes about four weeks and we can truncate this to two weeks. And most of the paths that we're coordinating for Mimosa we're truncating to two weeks. The third step is the application filing when we submit the path information to the FCC. It's at this time, uh, once your path has been submitted to the FCC, that you may begin transmission. It may then take the FCC about four to six weeks to grant your license, but uh, you'll have conditional authorization to transmit as soon as the FCC has your application. The fourth step, and it's a last and very important step, is called the Schedule K filing. And it's the construction notification that we file on your behalf with the FCC. So the moment that your path is operational, uh, we need to notify the FCC. So it's very important that you convey this information to us. Um, otherwise, the, the FCC uh, can uh, dissolve the frequencies. So those are the four main steps, the frequency analysis, where we select the precise channel, the coordination, where we circulate a document and, and receive responses, um, the application filing, at which point you, begin, you can begin transmission, and the construction notification. So how do we get your path information? Um, probably the most efficient way if, if you're going to buy a B11 is to send us your path information via Mimosa's design tool. 
which is available on their website. The crucial pieces of information that we require in order to study your path are the site coordinates and also the antenna heights. If you know um, what size antenna you want to use, that's also helpful. It'll help our analysis uh, be more accurate, um, but it's not absolutely crucial. If you want us to make an antenna size recommendation, we can do that. Um, but in order to uh, select a channel for you, we need your site coordinates um, as well as the, the antenna heights. So um, yeah, once you log into the Mimosa design tool and submit your path information, the information is then fed to the Intel path, inf the Intel path in engineers uh, for us to select a precise channel for you to use. So how do we go about uh, determining if the channel we select won't cause any interference? <clears throat> um, so the FCC Part 101 rules and regulations has guidelines in terms of how we calculate interference uh, for each of the bands. So we must strictly follow the TSB 10 guidelines and adhere to that standard in, in terms of uh, calculating whether or not the proposed path will, will meet the interference objective uh, for the particular channel that we're targeting. Um, <clears throat> in congested areas um, where it's more difficult to find open channels uh, than non-congested areas, there are a couple different tricks that, that we can do to try to open a channel. It depends on a few variab variables. Um, one thing that we can do is we can try to reduce the transmit power. So assuming that the path will allow for a slight transmit power reduction if it's not a super long path, if, if it'll allow for the transmit power reduction, and also assuming that we're not too far from meeting the interference objective, if we're off by a few dB, sometimes this trick will help us open up a channel. Another thing we can do is we can um, upgrade to an antenna that has a narrower beam width. So even though a larger antenna might have a higher gain, that narrower beam width might help us to to open up a channel in some situations. The third thing we can do is we can change the azimuth of your path. So this is, this is kind of a last resort. If we're able to identify which particular victims are holding us back from obtaining a channel, we can coach you on how to route around that congestion and, and, and by changing the azimuth, find an open channel for you. So there are a few things that we'll do rather than um, send your path back and say, sorry, there, there's not an open channel for you. We'll try uh, to give as much feedback as we can. Um, so the next step is uh, um, the prior coordination notice. Um, so like I said, this is the most time intensive step. Um, your, your path information, we don't circulate it to um, just everyone but rather those who have a path within a certain distance of yours and within the same band. So if you're using a B11, um, we're not going to circulate your path to someone that's operating in 18 gigahertz, for example. And also, the shape that we cut um, in terms of identifying victims is not a precise circle. It's rather a keyhole shape of, of the path's propagation. Um, so those particular um, victims that fall in, inside of that keyhole shape, um, they'll receive a notification from us with your proposed path, and they'll be given two weeks uh, to review the path and respond with an objection. Now, their objection has to have data to support their claim of interference. So the burden's really on them to articulate that the path itself will cause interference into theirs. So they can't simply say, um, you know, we feel that your path might cause interference and, and you need to demonstrate that it won't. Um, you know, when we select a channel, our path, uh, soft, our software has already identified it as an interference-free channel. So the burden's on them to, um, to, to argue their case. Now, if no one responds, 
um, and we receive no responses, the FCC rules stipulate that a non-response is the equivalent to a positive uh, response. Um, so if no responses are, are received in this um, time period, we're clear then to proceed uh, with the filing. So most of the Part 101 bands, and this also includes 11 gigahertz, will allow for immediate transmission to begin um, once the applications are filed. There are a few exceptions, mainly in areas close to um, the international borders, like I said. But um, under that circumstance, uh, we'll let you know ahead of time so you can pl uh, plan your installation around that. The FCC takes about four to six weeks to review the application and grant the actual license. So once it's granted, you'll receive a hard copy of your license in the mail. <clears throat> if you lose your copy, just let us know and we can send you an electronic copy at any time. Now the very last step of the licensing process is very important. Um, it's called the construction notification, otherwise known as the Schedule K filing. You must notify the FCC as soon as your path is constructed. So like I said before, um, we can notify the FCC on your behalf as long as you tell us what the construction date is. If you fail to notify the FCC, you'll get a reminder in the mail. So don't ignore this reminder. If you fail to construct within an 18-month period, the FCC will actually decommission your path from the database. And um, you might be transmitting uh, illegally. So, um, so this is the, the very last step, and it's a pretty crucial step in the the licensing process. So how long is your license good for? Uh, it's good for a 10-year period. Um, at the, uh, the end of the 10 years, 90 days prior to expiration, you'll be given an opportunity to renew the license, and not any earlier than that. So if you're three years uh, before expiration date, you can't renew ahead of time you'll be given a very specific window of opportunity to, to renew the license. Um, and you'll also get a notice in the mail. Um, again, if you ignore the notice, there are some remedies for us um, in terms of reinstating your license if it actually is terminated. We can file what's called a petition for reconsideration. Um, so the, the fee the fee to renew your license at the end of the 10-year period is actually equivalent to whatever a new license fee is um, 10 years from now. So I've been doing this for a little over 10 years, and the, the fees haven't fluctuated much beyond, I think, $650. Um, so that's pretty much it in a nutshell. The, the whole FCC licensing process from start to finish. Um, just to summarize, it's the, the frequency analysis where we select an interference-free channel for you, uh, the coordination where we circulate the document, the application filing, and uh, then the construction filing. Um, so, Lee, I, I'll turn things back over to you um, to talk about the, the B11 uh, specifically. Thanks Liz for, for running us through that process. Liz has been a great partner for us in helping us understand the, the market and where the opportunities exist for the B11 and she's available as a resource for you guys to work with as you try and understand what could possibly be done with the product. So I wanted to talk a, a little more specifically about what we do with the B11 that's a little bit different to the other devices that are out there. The, the important, one of the most important things to understand is how is licensing a B11 different? We're not a traditional uh, FDD Part 101 radio. And what I mean by that is that if we look at a traditional licensing for a, a Part 101 radio, there's usually a high frequency and a low frequency as a frequency pair that are licensed 490 megahertz apart. And then we communicate in an FDD fashion over those where one radio TX is uh, in, in one frequency and then RX is back in the other. What we've done with the, the way we interpret the, the regulations from the FCC and the, the way we're able to actually run TDMA over these links 
is that we then turn around and from site A to site B and site B to site A, license those same frequencies back in the other direction. So you could almost think about it as like licensing two radios at those sites, but having the, the same pairs and flipping them around. Now, that is that is allowed in the regulations. There's no reason why that can't be done here in the US. And where that really plays out in terms of the benefit is that if we think about a traditional Part 101 FDD radio, the nature of that split uh, between the high and low frequency means that I'm in a situation where I'm only ever able to operate 50-50 from a downstream and upstream perspective. We all know that these networks have moved more and more towards uh, needing more capacity in the downstream. Anything used in residential uh, or even a lot of business applications is always going to have more demand on the downstream. So we get this situation where I'm oversubscribed on my downstream and I'm not really using the upstream. The upstream might only be 10 or 20% of what I'm doing in the downstream direction. We see that as a very inefficient use of spectrum. Now, because we are licensing those pairs the way as I showed you on the, the previous slide, we treat those channels as a, a, a contiguous uh, block of, of frequency that we run TDMA over. So we don't stick to TXing and RXing and high and low. We, we run them in the same way as a B5, if you're familiar with that platform, and we apply TDMA to be able to dynamically adjust the demand based on the flow of traffic. And so in a situation where I have more demand in a downstream direction, the B11 radio will assign more time slots in that downstream direction to make sure that capacity is getting met. And then if that changes because either there's some event that's causing there to be a lot of upstream traffic, or say you're in a ring configuration where the concept of downstream and upstream might flip if there's a break in that, that ring, uh, the radio is able to adapt and be able to adjust the time slots from a TDMA perspective back up uh, and, and do the traffic in the direction where it's really needed. So some specifics about the, the B11 as a product itself. Uh, GPS synchronization is something else we bring into this platform. So that is useful when I want to locate multiple B11s in the same site. Uh, so we have the ability to take a single uh, a pair of, of channels or a, a you know, number of channels that we operate in and use GPS to synchronize the TX and RX between up to four radios at a single site. Uh, so that means that we can get a lot more efficiency around not just from running TDMA on top of these channels that we license. That gives us that ability to be dynamic, uh, but also the ability then to reuse that channel in, in multiple paths, in multiple directions. So that's that's a, a, a big deal and you know a lot of the tech that we do here this is a, a product that is specifically built for this frequency uh, but it's not it, a lot of the tech and a lot of the underlying platform and a lot of the software is things that have been leveraged from the B, B5 so it's not like this was a starting from scratch clean paper design we had a lot of the components we needed to make this thing do what it does from our work and our experience uh, with the with the B5 product uh, very low power consumption, so 20 to 30 watts, 30 watts peak, you know, around 20 watts typical. IP67 protection, so similar to what we have in the B5 platform around gas discharge tubes, both in the radio unit and in the POE itself, uh, which gives us protection against lightning and other ESD events. Uh, this is also our first product that we've launched with an SFP port. So you have the ability to power it over copper and then use SFP for the data port as well. So that's that's been very well received and, and in this class of products, something that people would usually expect. Now, from a latency perspective, that is a question that comes up when comparing an FDD radio, one of the traditional legacy radios, with the, the, the way that we, we do things with TDMA. Uh, so we're able to get latency of a two, you know, one to two milliseconds, typically, uh, which, is, which is usually for the type of services our, our customers are deploying this enough. Will you get a lower latency figure with a full FDD radio? Yes, you will. Uh, but we're, we're saying that really from the perspective of running this for data services and for internet services and for anything that you're going to run over this pipe typically, that's not really something that will have a, a noticeable impact on performance because we have a lot of people out there already using backhaul links that have a similar sort of latency profile in the unlicensed space. From a dish perspective, this doesn't show all the dishes. Uh, the, the mounting options on this is a, it's a circular waveguide feed, so the radio attaches onto the back of the dish. The mounting uh, that we've used for that, the, the layout of that is from Jiris, and the, the dishes that we have that are readily available now are the Jiris dishes in a variety of sizes there. The smaller dish, the one-foot dish, is not available for use in the US, uh, so that leaves us with options at two, three, and four feet. Uh, there is obviously times where you want to do a larger dish for longer links, where we would go up to a six-foot dish. 
that is available now through Radio Waves. Uh, we're going to update our, uh, our accessories page very soon to include some of these other options around there where other well-known manufacturers in this space have gone and made adapter kits and other things for that to give us a lot more flexibility in having a choice of dishes outside of just purely the, the, G, the, uh, the Jiris dishes that we use. So just sort of summarizing the features, uh, no one else is doing TDD or TDMA on top of license links in the same way we have. So we do believe that that's a much more efficient way to set your network up and a much more efficient way to use this very scarce and very valuable resource in terms of the frequency. Very cost competitive. So uh, from a performance perspective, if we're able to license the 280 megahertz channels that we use, we're able to operate where you can get more than a gig in, in any given direction. So it's not saying it's a gig in both directions simultaneously, but a gigabit per second of IP traffic or, and actually over that when, we, when we've seen some of the links in terms of what our customers are running in whichever direction is the downstream direction at that time. Uh, the GPS synchronization I've already spoken about, so we think that's a really useful feature. And again, we're all about efficiency. Efficiency to some people means running high modulation rates. So if you do a spec sheet comparison between us and some of the other radios out there, we're a 256, uh, four, uh, 264 QAM radio. Uh, you'll see others 1024 QAM uh, and sometimes higher than that. So the modulation rates getting pushing higher does in theory give you the ability to push more traffic, but it also, as you step up in modulation rates, makes the radios more susceptible to interference and it, it can be sometimes harder to maintain those high modulation rates. So our approach to efficiency uh, as a 256 QAM radio, sorry to correct myself there, is that we're able to reuse that same frequency pair in other directions, which is, is a way to drive the efficiency of the use of that, that spectrum. Uh, latency we've already spoken about. Uh, one of the unique features for, that we have versus other radios, and this again is something we borrowed uh, from a technique perspective from what we did in the B5, is the ability to perform spectrum analysis in the background. So. There is a risk that there are uh, you know, bad operators out there who are potentially going to not know what they're doing and run in a frequency that you're, you've got licensed. Because we have the spectrum analyzer there and then combine the spectrum analyzer with the fact that we can monitor this stuff from the cloud, you can see whether suddenly there's a new transmitter that's popped up in one of your channels that's going to impair the performance of your radio and see historically when did that occur by looking at a snapshot view in the cloud in the, which is free and available to use with this product to see is there is there points back in time where there was a, a problem with the a problem with the uh, the spectrum and, and a new interference source getting getting introduced uh, and then the power consumption we're very proud of the fact that we can push a gig at the level uh, the a gigabit per second of traffic at the power footprint that we can which means that this is something you could take and install on a solar site or a, a site with battery backup and not be worried about it being a power hog that's going to burn your batteries down too quickly. One of the ways we like to think about our products is from a dollars per megabits per second served. Uh, so if we do an apples to apples comparison versus some of the other options out there, you can see there we're around that sort of you know, 3 to $3.50 per uh, megabit per second served. So you're taking the Performance of the radio and dividing it by the price is how we calculate that. So we're, you know, 60 to 70 percent cheaper than any of the other options that are out there on the market today, and able to deliver more performance on a lot of those platforms as well. Liz already spoke about the tool, which is a, our design tool. That's a great starting point if you want to go out and understand what is available for you to use. So we took the entire ULS database from the FCC and we plot it and we, we visualize it within the design tool so you can go and look and say, okay, what else is available in my area? What other points are there where I could even potentially identify tower sites that I can share because I can see who else is running licensed radios, not just at 11, but also in other, other licensed frequencies as well, even though we don't have products in that space. Uh, this was primarily built for the 11, but we figured whilst we had the data for the other frequencies, let's map those in here as well. So. Uh, very great starting point as you go through, fill this out. When you click the submit button, we give you the option of submitting those details to Liz, and that can start her process in terms of looking at getting the license and coordination step going. Uh, so that's it from me. Uh, there are a few questions here that I'll, I'll go through. Um, so first one is around stock, stock availability. So good news is that the B11s are rolling out of the factory and they are in the air now. 
Uh, what I will do is I will have each of your respective sales reps reach out to any of the distributors and the VARs that are on this, this uh, webinar and make sure we give you some specifics about when you're actually going to get stocked. But the, the great news is that this is a, a good timing from our perspective. We have a backlog to clear, uh, but we also want to be able to get new people excited about the radios and have them be available and get the and get the uh, the, the 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 radios in the hand, you know, and get them up and running as quickly as possible. Uh, so, question for you, Liz, around how we approach the GPS synchronization from the FCC. Do you want to take that one? So how does the FCC yeah, do sure. GPS sync? Yeah, so it says, does the FCC recognize uh, GPS sync for coordination? That's a really good question um, because the, the B11 utilizes GPS sync, so you can actually um, be co-located and co-channel and reuse the same channel as long as there's enough uh, angular separation. Um, it's, it's feasible. Uh, the FCC, um, they don't look at in terms of when they process the applications, they're not looking for specific details on that. What they're looking for is um, whether or not uh, uh, the coordination uh, cleared without conflict. Um, so in terms of the, the specific details of the coordination itself, GPS sync, as long as we push it through and get approval from the other operators and um, whoever's protecting their network, if they're being protected by another frequency coordinator, that's very common, they might raise a concern. As long as we've uh, obtained approval to move forward with the filing, the FCC, uh, they, 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 won't, they won't look at it in any further detail. Um, so really it's just an issue of pushing it through the coordination for approval and filing it with the FCC and the FCC is just going to look to make sure that uh, we successfully coordinated the path. Yeah, and that, that is a, available today. That, that feature is in there and working in the product. Uh, it does change the, the options around how you configure the TDMA. So I spoke about the auto TDMA mode, which we can do when it's a single link uh, because we don't have anything else to coordinate with. Now, if I want to put a second radio on that same frequency pair on that same tower, I then need to uh, allocate those time slots statically. And what I mean by that is that there's an option to uh, allocate the time slots on a 50-50 basis or on a 75-25 basis biased more towards the downstream direction. Uh, so that is where uh, you do need to think about the configuration and what you're trying to achieve on the, on the radio as to whether you would go license a new pair uh, or whether you would, you would uh, go try and license that same pair and be able to GPS sync them using static TDMA configuration. Okay, that's it for questions. I don't see anything else here. So uh, thank you for attending everybody. Really do appreciate you taking some time out of your day. Big thank you to Liz for participating uh, and, and, and being willing to come here and talk us through the process so we can all learn a little bit more about it. Uh, so again, thank you everybody and uh, look out for more of these to the point webinars going forward. Uh, our objective is to try to do them every two weeks. The next one coming up is not for three weeks because we have the Labor Day weekend here in the US. Uh, so look out for some information about that soon. Thank you.